Greetings, Play on Plug fans. It's Enrico Nardini here at Historicon 2013. We're over at the Warlord booth. I'm talking with Chris Woodward. And he's going to tell us a little bit about some of the new and exciting things going on. But first, Chris, just a couple things. Oh, my goodness. World War Games. We're talking bolt action, yeah. black powder, yep. hail Caesar. Yep. Is there a period you guys don't do? Mm, soon uh, there is a period that we don't do currently, which is current and future. That's coming. So. Well, Awesome, great, awesome. So what are some of the new and exciting things you guys have on offer? I, when I go on the internet, I see like a new release like almost every day from yeah, you guys. So absolutely, absolutely. Well, the key thing for us is, is that when we took on the bolt action line, we actually had the whole line of models and no rules. In, in historical gaming, it's very common. A lot of the people, unfortunately, are left to trying to cobble together certain rule sets as they found online or at random conventions, and then go and find the models to fit that that rule set. Sometimes we end up playing with toys. Sometimes we end up trying to convert our own stuff. The real strength about what we have in the bolt action line is you get both sides, both sides of it right away. Every single thing you can think of as far as the World War II line, we have it as a model. Now, we're catching up with our actual rules. We released bolt action last year. We're written by Rick Priestley and Alesso Caviatore. Strong rules published by Osprey. Beautiful, amazing book. And then we followed up with several army books all the way through uh, now with the Japanese, which launched just a couple of weeks ago, opening up the Pacific Theater for us. Something we feel in the World War II genre has been really ignored over the last few years. Uh, and you guys are demoing uh, American Marines versus Japanese right now. Yeah, right now, absolutely, on our Pacific board. We wanted to give people an idea of what is actually possible when you open up that Pacific Theater. Uh, this is the Battle of Tarawa. Right now we have the testing out the new Japanese rules versus the Marines. Come on, what kind of American players don't want to play Marines? We all know they're a bunch of badasses. We want to be able to put those guys on the tabletop and see what they can do, right? So there you go. That's the option there. Now, in the future, we're going to be releasing plastic Marines. We're going to be releasing plastic Japanese. What, allow that, what that allows us to do is take a box set and slam in every single bits that we can think of, pieces of equipment, people's pieces of tat, just really good stuff that can make a hobbyist, a modeler, have so much joy in building their army the way they want it. Every individual model looks the way they want it to look, is equipped with what they want it to have. So it makes that meaningful. That skirmish-based, squad-based game, when you put your guys on the tabletop, it's meaningful to you. Uh, also, what we're coming out with is uh, the New France and the Minor Powers books, right? Because a lot of people like to play the Polish, the Norwegians, or the French, then we're going to get full-blown army lists for those as well, along with the entire model support. So. A lot of the like, kind of the more niche, niche stuff, but people love that. A lot of people love that, absolutely. You know, so often we get people coming up and saying, "Where's your Polish line? I really want to play Pol. I want to charge tanks. Come on, let me do that." We all know that didn't actually happen in the war, but people still like to see it happen, right? So what we do is we come up with the Polish army list, the Polish cavalry. We come up with all, everything you need to have in order to. For put out that Polish army. That especially, especially, I think, like, people, like, I know that I have a, one of my friends, like, he likes to do Romanians because he's Romanian. Exactly. Well, we all have our only little pieces of history that we find interesting, that we think are really, really special. And if we can explore that piece of history on the tabletop, oh, man, it matches two of our biggest passions together. So that's what Warlord's really about. It's really about taking the depth and breadth of the historical in, uh, interaction, the ex historical experience, and trying to encapsulate that and put that experience on a tabletop for people. So let's say somebody's never played bolt action before. They, they, they're, they're, they'd be brand new to, to you know, the skirmish level World War II. What do you think makes bolt action special? Like, if you're, if, if you're, talking, to our, you know, you're talking to our fans right now, why should they get into bolt action? Wow, I don't even know where to start. Uh, I'm a gamer, okay? I played everything. The first game, uh, war game I ever played was old school Battletech, that when you held the model too long, you got lead poisoning, right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm in. What we all as gamers want from it, right? We want a fun experience. We want to be able to show up with some models, spend our money, so that we can enjoy the game. Yeah? Number one, all of us have games that we've purchased in the past that have rotted in our closets, or maybe we played for a week or two and then just disappeared. Reason you want to be able to get into bolt action is because it is constantly growing. Everybody who plays this game, like these guys here, just playing the game for the first time, they love it. Okay, which means our community is growing, your opportunities to play is growing, our, our account bases with our trade bases that are behind the product is growing. This is the best time to get into that. 
Second reason about bolt action, and I'll talk more about the gameplay itself. The gameplay is unique enough with random turn order and pin markers and the way the in the, uh, units function that you're going to be familiar, familiar with it as soon as you start playing it. You're like, okay, I understand these concepts. They're very intuitive. I, I, I've played somewhat like this before. But there's also enough nuance to the game that it's a completely different way to, to think strategy. You're not going to be able to sit down. If I'm a war gamer, I'm not going to be able to sit down and master it in 10 minutes. I'm not going to be able to do math hammer and say, all right, I know exactly what I should be fielding. It's not there. Those kind of things don't exist. I play a lot of games, a lot of games when I sit down across from somebody, if I'm playing a, a fantasy game or a 40K game or something like that, I know exactly what the guy has before he puts it on the tabletop, right? Everybody's, oh, great. It's that rhino rush or it's, it's the, you know, the, uh, the uh, Imperial Guard uh, parking lot army. I know. I've seen that, right? Well, with this, so many different variables, so many different levels to just a British army or a German army. You can build it in so many different ways. That's what brings, uh, brings us to the tabletop. I heard something interesting when I was watching one of your demos yesterday, and I, I, I think it speaks to the strength of the rule set, that units can be, for, say, pinned out of combat. They're not actually killed. They just, they, they, they just don't take part in the battle because they're being pinned down by, by, uh, by gunfire, and that's like a tactic that's viable in the game that adds a little bit of that realism once again. It's not, the object isn't to wipe out the other side, it's to, it's for some kind of tactical victory. Absolutely, I mean, who hasn't watched a historical movie or a, uh, even an action movie and seen where people are pinned down behind cover, taking constant incoming fire, and just simply not able to bring themselves to follow an order, yeah? How many times have we said, seen people say, get up the hill, get up the hill, and people sit down and say, I'm not going anywhere. There's no way I'm going up that hill. Well, that's a, there's a concept in that in the game called pinning. Every time you shoot at a unit and hit the unit, whether you hit them one time or ten times, whether you kill anybody or not, they get penny markers. And those penny markers start to stack up. And when they're stacked up so high, that unit just sits down. Says, oh, I ain't going nowhere. And But those can be compensated by lieutenants coming over, leading the unit. There's orders you can give the squad that removes pin markers. Every time you do make a successful check, you get to remove one pin marker. So it becomes very tactical. Where do I place my lieutenants in order to get the best chance for my leadership to assist? When do I actually just go to ground and hide that unit yeah, and remove, get to remove a pin marker? Are there also some really die-hard units that just ignore that stuff completely? Oh, absolutely. And like, for instance, the Japanese. If the Japanese want to charge someone, yeah, they remove all their pin markers. Yeah, they, so as soon as you get into combat with somebody, you remove all your pin markers, and the Japanese don't have to check to, to charge in. Because, let's face it, they were dug into those islands in the Pacific, told to defend them with whatever they had, whether it was their fists or their or fight off and fight, continue to fight in the spiritual world. Just get in there and don't give up, right? And that's, those are represented, again, really well by the rules that uh, Rick and Alessio put together. Now I would be I would be remiss if we didn't talk very briefly about uh, the dice, which are which are one of those things that people really get excited about. Let's see if we can grab one, because bolt action uses some special dice. Yeah, absolutely. We use what's called an order die. Now there's two mechanics at this. Up for the two mechanics. In case you guys haven't seen this before. Two mechanic mechanics in the game that this helps. Okay. First of all, it's not a you go, I go scenario. Everybody's played those games. We are all familiar with those games. So we have fun playing those games. This is not one of those games. What we do is we take a die for each side for every unit that's on the tabletop. So for this particular game, we've got a Japanese die and we've got a Marine die. And all the dice get dumped into a bag, a bucket, what have you. Mm -hmm. Then we randomly pull one. And if it's a marine die or Japanese die, the Japanese player gets handed that die and he designates any one of his units on the board to do an order. And all the orders are on the die. So he can have them advance, go forward and shoot, run, move at double movement, uh, stand and fire at full effect, get down, hide, all of these things. And you choose what order they, they're given. You choose which unit moves in what order. Yeah. But what we don't know is who's going to be able to move a unit next, yeah? And when, because that dynamics in the game, every single pull of the die becomes a game of itself. And it, and it introduces that kind of fog of war concept where you don't know, a more realistic concept, where you don't know who's going to go next. It's hard to plan 
uh, you know, you have your, you might have your overall strategy, but it's hard to plan turn by turn Absolutely. what you're going to do. Absolutely, it's, it's what really makes it interesting is if I pull a die and submarine die. Now the tactics start rolling back and forth. Okay, if I know if I fire my mortar now before his uh, his unit moves, I'm going to have a better chance of hitting him. But I have to fire my tank because if I don't fire my tank, his anti-tank -ar artillery might kill it before I get to move my tank. And it goes back and forth. So which one? Oh, wait, my sniper. Oh, man, if I use my sniper and take out his forward observer before he's able to activate his artillery. So now it's choices. And, okay, do I want to take a risk? Do I want to go ahead and shoot my tank and pray that the next die isn't a Japanese die and he's going to take me down, right? It goes every single pull of the die goes back and forth. Now, at first, when I played the game, I was worried. I was like, okay, well, is that going to mean that it's all just depending on the pull of the die out of the bucket? It isn't. It's all about tactical choices, choices of fire. What is the single most important unit for you to move now? Right? What are you willing to sacrifice in this round of combat? Right? What's more important? And that the game constantly makes you make those choices. I think people would agree that's what makes a good game. Oh, it's it's really, really intense mechanic. Really, really ha it makes your game, your tactical game, come up to another level. Well, Chris, thank you so much for spending some time talking to the Play Unplugged fans. We're really excited to see what goes on in Warlord Games. They should check out uh, WarlordGames.com, and uh, we're going to be at Gen Con as well, so come out and see us. Awesome. We'll absolutely come out and see you. Chris, thank you so much for spending time with us. My, my pleasure. <laughs> Folks, I'm Enrique Nardini. This is Chris Woodward for Warlord Games. PlayOnPlug.com. Make sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, come visit the website, subscribe to this YouTube channel, all that awesome social media stuff, and we'll see you next time.